Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. Happening right now in Houston, an investigation is underway after two police officers were shot while responding to a call about a disturbance. That's according to our sister station, KPRC. Houston police say the two officers, as well as a suspect, were all taken to the hospital. No word on what led up to that shooting. One of the industries struggling the most to recover amid this pandemic, the bars. But now some relief could be on the horizon. A plan to help bars reopen is up for discussion at the Bear County Commissioner's Court. The Bear County Restaurant and Beverage COVID-19 grant program will include about $3 million in grants for restaurants and bars impacted by the pandemic. It comes after Judge Nelson Wolf announced last week that the bars that had not already opened as restaurants or reopened as restaurants could open their doors as long as they followed certain restrictions. He said that since the announcement, only 10 bar owners have contacted his office about wanting to reopen. Wolf plans to file the paperwork today and the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission would take up to 48 hours to approve the filing. So bars should be able to open later this week or early next week. If the commissioner's court approves the grant program to help bars, owners will be able to apply for up to a $25,000 in grant money starting on Monday. COVID-19 cases reaching a plateau in Bear County. That's according to Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Our seven day average stands at 159. 193 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. 84 people are in the intensive care unit and 36 patients are on ventilators. Two more people have died. While there has been an improvement in our two week decline in cases, our positivity rate remains at 5.8%. Meantime, across the nation, more than 220,000 Americans have died since the pandemic began and cases are rising in much of the country. Health experts warn as we head into cooler weather, we are also heading the wrong direction. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest on the fight to stop the spread of the deadly virus. El Paso, Texas, now considered a major hot zone of COVID-19 here in the U.S. We are in the surge, and this is by far the, the highest number of patients that we've had since the pandemic began. Doctors and nurses in the ICU at the University Medical Center working overtime to save those battling the virus. You ready? So in the last two weeks, we have seen a very sharp increase in positive cases. Uh, to about 500% increase. Similar scenes unfolding at hospitals across the country with hospitalizations up in 41 states. Pastor Harrison Johnson died after a four month battle with the virus. I don't wish this on my worst enemy. One in five hospitals reporting more than 80% of their ICU beds filled, which is higher than the summertime peak. Healthcare workers at the University of North Carolina Hospital in Chapel Hill trying to keep up with the influx of patients. It's probably another day I don't cry. We've watched lots of patients die from this. In Kansas, 10 patients dying in this nursing home after an outbreak spread to all 62 patients in the facility and several staff members. Health experts pleading with people to wear masks and keep social distancing. Mississippi's governor reimposing mask mandates in nine counties after they expired a few weeks ago. Meantime, millions of Americans are still waiting for economic relief. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is in talks with Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and says a deal has to be struck by the end of today if they're going to get a stimulus package before the election. If they don't reach an agreement, relief may not be here until next year. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Back here at home, some other top stories we are following this noon. A driver hit and killed a man who was crossing a west side street. The crash happened around 4 this morning in the 7300 block of Loop 410, not far from the Calabar Road exit. Police tell us the man was walking across the southbound lanes of the highway when a driver in a Ford F-250 hit him. Investigators say the driver was unable to avoid hitting the man and is not expected to face charges. The man was pronounced dead at the scene. And police are also investigating this rollover crash on Loop 410, this time on the city's northwest side near Cherry Ridge. Officers say a woman was thrown from her vehicle. It happened around 3 this morning. Police say the woman was the passenger in a Jeep and the driver lost control and crashed. She was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Investigators are trying to determine if alcohol played a factor in that crash. No drivers were other drivers were involved.
safety while sharing the roads with cyclists. It's an issue bike riders are hoping to bring to the forefront, and it's why a man killed while riding his bike last year will be honored by the cycling community tonight. Today would have been Tito Bradshaw's 37th birthday. He was hit and killed on East Houston Street by a suspected drunk driver last April. Since then, those in the cycling community have called for action from city officials. I haven't seen a whole lot of changes on the street. Uh, there hasn't been any additional uh, bike infrastructure. There hasn't been any uh, protected bike lanes, anything like that. District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino says they are using multiple resources like pedestrian mobility officers to put together a plan for safe bike lanes. Meanwhile, the cycling community will hold a virtual ride tonight in honor of Bradshaw. Riders can start from wherever they choose, ride past his memorial ghost bike, which will be located at 1938 East Houston Street. While at the memorial site, riders are encouraged to take a photo and share it online using the hashtag Tito Bradshaw forever. Port San Antonio is one of the technology hubs of the Alamo City. Already, the port contributes more than $5 billion to the Texas economy with tens of thousands of jobs. And as Max Massey shows us, more and more businesses are choosing to come to Port SA and the Alamo City. One of the latest is involving a giant laser. We are in the midst of startup week and one of the big parts of the technology industry here in San Antonio is Port San Antonio and one of the newest companies here at the port involves this. It's a huge laser and we're joined here with the president and CEO of the company, Peter. So Peter, what is the purpose of this laser? Yeah, the purpose of this laser is installed on a robot and we use that robot to depaint, strip paint from aircraft. There's uh, the, in, in international language is the people, planet of profit. So profit is of course very important. Everybody wants to use the laser, wants to uh, earn money on it, with it. You have to pay for it. And on the other side, uh, you ha don't have any risk anymore on the health uh, of people. So it's, uh, the, the current situation is they hand sand planes or they use chemicals which you inhale. These are dangerous for your health. Third element is environmental. Environmental, we don't use 4,000 gallons of water anymore. We don't use 300 gallons of, of solvent chemicals anymore. Um, so it's very good for the environmental. All right, Peter, thank you so much. And joined now, President and CEO of Port San Antonio. So what does this mean for the Alamo City? What this means is we're continuing to incorporate new technologies into the existing industries that we do so well. And as Peter said, it's not only saving the world and it's saving people's lives, but it is making the, the job more efficient. And what that does is it creates more jobs, it creates more value for our community. And guys, here it is, Port San Antonio, bringing more to the local economy, one business at a time. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. So to come this half hour, not a good night for the quarterback, not a good night for the running back. That means not a good night for the Cowboys. A local woman reaching a milestone today. How the community helped this lady celebrate turning 102. And we've got two cold fronts now in the seven day forecast. We'll tell you when they arrive and what it means as far as rain chances go coming up. She was born the year that the Spanish flu broke out and attributes her long life to years of gardening. Sarah Acosta introduces us to Ozell Jordan, who turned 102 today. Her local assisted living center in Live Oak threw a birthday parade. Happy birthday, Ozell Jordan. She is 102 today. To celebrate, the residents and workers at Serenity Oaks Assisted Living and Memory Care held a drive-by parade by the Live Oak Police Department. Jordan was born in 1918. That's the year the Spanish flu broke out. She graduated from Harlandale High School in 1935. She was only 17 years old when she graduated because back then her high school only went to the 11th grade. She has two children, three grandchildren and six great grandchildren. She's just full of life. You know, she's just um, always joking around and happy all the time. Uh, she's just you know, full of life for 102. You know, she's with it and she's aware of everything going on. And we just wanted to show her how much we love her. The baby boy at the parade is two months old. That makes him and Jordan more than 101 years apart in age. 
Jordan is a Rangers, Astros, and Spurs fan. The Spurs even sent her a goodie bag for her birthday. She attributes her long life to many years of gardening, and her third grade teacher added the last E to her first name, Ozell, because her teacher said it sounded better. Happy birthday, Ozell Jordan. Awesome. That is so cool. <laughs> she looks great. Yeah. Look at the generations of 102 and then the little baby right there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's cool. A picture. Yeah. You just Happy have a birthday. few more years to go, David. Thank you. We're getting there. Wow. Okay, the aquifer. Uh, it is down half a foot to 659.6. We do not have a pollen count today. We'll get it to you tomorrow. Uh, we're also watching a couple fronts, some that could really cool us down by next week. We'll talk more about it coming up. It was a little warm for a birthday party, though, wasn't it? Up there on the well, I think that's why they had it early this morning. This morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very humid out there yeah. still. Yeah, the clouds at least provide a, a little bit of shade for some time, but it's it's warm out there. It's warm and humid, and the humidity sticks with us to the end of the week. We will lose it eventually. It will feel like fall. I promise. We're gonna get there. Uh, but we got sure? to get. <laughs> we got to get to this work week first. Rainfall is something we need too. Uh, we're down quite a bit. We've only picked up about five hundredths of an inch so far this month. Two hundredths of that was this morning. We had a little shower move right over the airport. Uh, so we're about two and a half inches below average for the month. But look at the year. Eight and a half inches now below average. 18.24. This has been a, a dry summer leading into a dry fall. So we need something to change here. And looking at the time lapse, a lot of clouds this morning. We had a couple of showers try to move through, and then these clouds have since been scattering out. Now we've got some sun. 85 degrees south southeasterly winds at about 16 miles per hour. That's driving in a ton of moisture. Dew point is at 69. There you see the clouds, and they'll continue to uh, scatter out even more. We'll probably go partly cloudy to mostly sunny this afternoon. Temperatures already racing upwards. 87 degrees in New Braunfels. 85. San Antonio 82 Stinson yesterday we got up to 92 would not be surprised if we got in the 90s again today 83 Uvalde you'll notice that it is a little cooler out west these clouds are a little thicker hanging on a little bit longer places like Rock Springs still in the 70s but it'll be warm there today too once those clouds clear out dew points have been the big story closing in on 70 that's in the oppressive category and these dew points uh, are not letting up much that means we're going to see some warm overnight lows and we're going to see a heat index. I mean, it's late October. We'd like to get rid of heat indices, but we're not. Feels like 89 right now. Here in town, feels like 91. And Gonzalez feels like 90 in Kennedy. And those heat indices will probably be in the mid-90s in some cases later today. We had a couple showers earlier this morning. Those have since dissipated. It's not much on the radar right now. If we see anything, probably it'll be along the coast today and it'll just be a few minor showers. And then tomorrow morning we can see a few more of those little streamer showers pop up, but not a big deal. You look across the country, quite a bit of snow across parts of the Dakotas and Minnesota this afternoon. A lot of snow piling up there. Yesterday got a ton of snow across parts of Iowa, so it's been pretty busy there. And this is very winter like temperatures are cold up there. And they'll continue to see some snow accumulate 31 right now in Minneapolis. But all the cold air is staying bottled up north. And then you got warm air across much of the south. 81 in New Orleans, 80 in Memphis, 85 again here in San Antonio. Here's what our forecast looks like going forward. We're going to focus on the temperatures here, staying in the 80s pretty much all week. But as we get into Friday, here comes our next front. This isn't particularly strong. It'll draw in some slightly cooler air. It'll be drier. That's probably what you'll notice the most. Low 80s, low dew points on Saturday. Sunday, it warms back up. And then Monday, here comes the next front. This is the one that's really, I think, going to change things. It's going to bring in some much, much cooler air. Still a lot of question on timing here when it arrives. But one thing we're pretty sure of now is that this is going to bring a pretty good chance of rain. This is the output here as far as rain and, yes, snow across the Texas Panhandle, potentially, as we get into Monday and Tuesday. You know, we got to iron out the timing a little bit here. But we think during the day on Monday, we'll see some of that cooler air, windy conditions, and a pretty decent chance of rain. So that's what we have to look forward to next week. In the meantime, still hot. 90 degrees today, partly cloudy. Southeast Julie winds 5 to 15. Uh, tomorrow, 88, uh, close to 90 basically all the way through Friday. We'll see some of those morning clouds, morning drizzle. Drier on Saturday, 82, a little cooler. 
and then Monday. Windy. Right now we're going with 75. It all depends on the timing of that front. We'll keep you posted as we get closer. We'll be able to um, nail down that forecast a little bit better, guys. All right. I'll save the sweater dress that I've had out to wear all week <laughs> for Monday. Sounds good. Thanks. Yep. Hey, when the Cowboys needed Zeke to step up, he fumbled his opportunity away. And a big time, big game Friday night matchup and a big game coverage preview coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Oh, what a Monday night. Quarterback Andy Dalton got his first start as the Cowboys quarterback last night. Not exactly what he had in mind at home against the Cardinals. He needed some help from guys like Ezekiel Elliott. Got anything but first quarter. Dalton under some duress slips it out to Zeke and he ends up losing it. Cardinals recover at midfield and they turn that turnover into points. Second quarter, Kyler Murley, the quick toss, Christian Kirk, jet sweep, and you got yourself a six-yard touchdown run. Arizona up 7-0. Very next drive for Dallas. Handoff, Elliott. He puts it on the ground again. Fumbles on back-to-back -back snaps for the first time in his career. Sets the Cardinals up with another golden opportunity. They cash in. Kenyon Drake for the one-yard score. 14-0 Cardinals. And they strike again before the end of the half on their next possession. Murray going deep for Kirk. Got it in strike. Like he stretched out those arms and brought it in. 21 nothing after that 80 yard pass and catch and run. Cowboys trail 21 3 at the break. Second half, offense looking for a spark. Dalton goes deep for CD Lamb, but it's intercepted by Drake or Patrick at the 21 yard line. Check out the replay here, though. Lots of contact. He even grabs him like he's going to tackle him. Lamb ends up on the ground. Kirkpatrick ends up with the pass. No call for that interference. Turnover turns into points. Murray takes it himself. 28 3. Doesn't get any better for the Cowboys from there. After the game, Dalton talked about those turnovers. We're hurting ourselves with the turnovers, and we've got to get this fixed. It's, uh, it's been a trend this year, and um, especially early in games, and that's uh, affected how we've been able to play. We haven't been able to play, uh, like run our full offense and running how it uh, should be run just because we're getting down in these games because we are turning the ball over. So. Um, yeah, I think it's one of those things where we just, we got to get this fixed. We got to, the ball's the most important thing, and we, 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 we can't be handed it to the other team. All right, so here's the final once again, 38 to 10. Cardinals get it. Dallas is now 2-4, and four, but they still, after all that, lead the NFC East. And the big game in our big game coverage this Friday night will be a battle of the unbeatens. The 12th ranked Stevens Falcons in 12's top 12 will go up against the 4th ranked Brendan Bears Friday night at Ferris Stadium. Both teams coming to this game at 3-0 with the Bears 2-0 in the difficult district 29-6A. The Bears are coming off a 26-14 win over Reagan in a non-district contest this past Saturday. The Bears are averaging 39 points a game so far this season, while giving up only nine points behind quarterback Ashton DuBose, who already has 11 touchdowns this season. Nine in the air, two on the ground. Meanwhile, the Falcons are 3-0 for the first time in program history. All of their wins have come in district play with victories over Holmes, Warren, and Jay, where Stevens is averaging 36 a game while giving up just 14 points a game. So very similar before this showdown. Starting off there, you know, it just means a lot to us. You know, we had Jay, uh, Holmes, and then coming to Reagan. And after that, that's really getting us the momentum. I just know they're a good team. Uh, they're going to bring it every time. Uh, they were big on turnovers. So we just got to have 100% ball security. And I feel like we could be good. We never beat Brennan. Out of since school opened, we never beat Brennan. And we have one goal, and that's to beat them. I know they're, they're a good team, well coached team. One of the best teams in the city for sure. And it's going to be a good game. Kickoff between Brennan and Stevens at Ferris Stadium on Friday, set for 7.30. Great night for football. Oh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, we'll be right back. According to the United States Election Project, a record 31 million Americans have already cast their ballots. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump continues to downplay the coronavirus despite surges across the nation in some areas. ABC's Elizabeth Schultz has the latest as Election Day approaches. 
With COVID hospitalizations surging in 41 states, President Trump again dismissing the pandemic that has cost more than 220,000 American lives. People are pandemic out. You know that? They're pandemic out. The president waging a new line of attack against his rival Joe Biden for listening to the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Biden wants to lock it down. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. The Biden campaign saying listening to scientists isn't an attack, it's a badge of honor. The coronavirus redefining an election where the votes will start being counted in just two weeks. According to the United States Election Project, a record 31 million Americans have already cast their ballots. A 4-4 deadlock decision in the Supreme Court means Pennsylvania can keep counting mail-in ballots up to three days after Election Day because of possible delays from the pandemic. Many still lining up for hours to vote in person. I don't trust the mail-in. I want to make sure my vote is counted. A new ABC News Washington Post poll shows Joe Biden with a one-point lead over President Trump in the key battleground state of North Carolina. The state revealing Democrats are outpacing Republicans in early voting turnout 46 percent to 25. But many Republicans insist they have the advantage in registering new voters, and they're counting on a big turnout on Election Day. You know, we're supposed to be way behind until Election Day when all the Republicans go, and you're going to have a red wave like you've never seen before. Joe Biden is off the campaign trail again today, ahead of the final presidential debate. The debate commission now saying candidates' mics will be muted during their first two minutes of their answers to avoid the interruptions that plagued the first debate. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Lawmakers have to reach a deal on a COVID relief bill by the end of today if they want to have a stimulus package ready before the election. Just yesterday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi reported making some progress. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin agreed, calling talks productive for months. White House negotiators and top Democrats have been trying to hammer out an agreement on another round of relief aid. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle blaming each other for the holdup. From the start, the president has never taken this seriously, and neither has Mitch McConnell. Nancy Pelosi at this moment does not want to uh, do anything that's going to affect the election. Now, both sides are still hundreds of millions of dollars apart at odds over key provisions like funding for state and local governments and plans for a national testing program. The Russian government says it is willing to freeze its nuclear arsenal to extend the new START treaty with the United States. According to a statement from the Russian Foreign Intelligence Ministry, the commitment would last one year and would only be implemented if the U.S. doesn't ask for additional demands. Last week, the U.S. rejected President Putin's offer to extend the deal for a year without any preconditions. The nuclear treaty is set to expire in February. Speaking of Russia, its military being accused of carrying out cyber attacks on the 2020 Olympics. The UK claims Russia targeted officials and organizations involved in planning the games that were scheduled to take place in Tokyo. Its foreign secretary condemned the actions Monday, calling the unit cynical and reckless. The UK also said the Russian body known as GRU also targeted the 2018 Winter Games, disguising itself as North Korean and Chinese hackers. Today, the Justice Department filed a lawsuit against Google, the DOJ, accusing the tech company of abusing its online dominance in online search to stifle competition and to harm consumers. Google controls about 90 percent of global web searches. Google argues that although its businesses are large, they are useful and beneficial to customers. It's main, it also maintains that its services, fa its services face ample competition. The litigation marks the government's most significant act to protect competition since its groundbreaking case against Microsoft. And that happened more than 20 years ago. NASA is hoping to make history this afternoon with its first ever asteroid sample return mission. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been orbiting the asteroid Bennu for about two years. During today's mission, the spacecraft will reach out its robotic arm and collect the sample from the asteroid's surface. Asteroids are remnants of the building blocks that form the planet in our solar system and perhaps enabled life on Earth. NASA hopes the mission will teach us more about our past while also help us protect ourselves against asteroids in the future. 
It's a marvel of engineering that we can approach and almost dock with an asteroid about the size of, you know, a small set of city blocks, touch it, sample the materials in a five second maneuver, back away, and then return those materials back to Earth for the women and men of future generations to study. It's kind of a gift that keeps on giving. And you can actually watch all that live. NASA will begin live coverage of the mission at 4 p.m. on NASA TV. The touch and go maneuver is scheduled for about 5:12. Live look outside with live cam, the sun coming out. And then somebody was saying something about meteor showers maybe tonight. Yeah, it's possible if the clouds crowd, it may be a little bit difficult to see. But by the way, how cool is that NASA mission? Yeah, that's awesome. I'm pretty sure that uh, we saw a movie like that Armageddon back in the day. Thought it could never happen. Eh, it's happening. That's pretty cool. Let's take a look at the temperatures throughout the state. We're starting to see things warm up here. 85 degrees in San Antonio, some 60s up in the Texas Panhandle. So it's still a little bit cool there, but temperatures are on the way up all across Texas uh, after some cool temperatures yesterday. Let's look at the cloud cover. You see the clouds scattering out here across our viewing area and we'll continue to see that trend. So a lot of sun this afternoon that'll push those temperatures up uh, close to 90. As far as rainfall goes, not much there. We had a couple showers earlier, picked up about two hundredths of an inch at the airport. Uh, now things are pretty quiet. We don't look for any rain chances throughout the rest of today. 89 degrees by four o'clock, partly cloudy, partly cloudy at six o'clock. Southeasterly winds 515 and yes, it stays humid. But we've got some good changes on the way. The seven day forecast looks a lot better this go around. We'll take a look coming up here in just a few minutes. Ursula. Thank you, Justin. COVID-19 has had an impact on our daily lives. However, it could also affect how long some people live. New research shows the virus could lead to lower life expectancy. ABC's Faith Abube has more. A new study shows that the COVID-19 pandemic could cause substantial declines in how long the average person lives. Researchers at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis built a simulation model to calculate the impact of COVID-19 on life expectancy. They found that the greater the rate of COVID-19 within the population, the more it'll affect life expectancy, especially in highly developed nations. If COVID-19 reaches 50% prevalence in places like Europe or North America, life expectancy could decrease by three to nine years. In fact, the pandemic could bring life expectancy down to less than 70 in the most developed nations, which is the same life expectancy Western Europe had 60 years ago. Remember, life expectancy will likely begin to recover once the pandemic is over. With this Medical Minute, I'm Faith Abube, ABC News. May not even be Halloween yet, but experts are warning that if you want to get your Christmas gifts in time, the time to start thinking about it is now why it might pay to shop early this year. Some retail workers could see a little more cash in their bank accounts. Target planning on handing out bonuses. How much money employees can expect to receive after the break. Some good news if you work for Target, the major retailer planning to pay out $70 million in bonuses to employees working this upcoming holiday season. 350,000 employees at Target will get a $200 bonus. The money will go to Target team members who work at all of the stores and distribution centers by early November. Target says it is its fourth round of pay incentives as the coronavirus pandemic continues to spread. The pandemic is changing the way a lot of things look this year and holiday shopping is one of them. More people than ever are expected to get their shopping done online. Experts are predicting a record amount of online shopping will lead to a record amount of shipping. One industry group estimates that between Thanksgiving and Christmas, more than 79 million packages a day will be shipped. That's compared to 65 million last year. To avoid delays, experts encouraging consumers to shop early and ship early. You see a deal, you should buy it early and definitely give yourself a lot of time. This is not the time to be a last minute shopper, particularly this year. And you want to make sure you check shipping deadlines. They could be different this year. FedEx and the U.S. Postal Service both say they are pushing up some of their delivery cutoff dates for some services by a few days to ensure your presents arrive on time. I'd like to order a little rain around here. 
live cam showing us sun, a little bit of clouds, and no rain. Uh, no rain. Uh, we had just a little bit this morning, two hundredths of an inch at the airport. Does that count? Uh, technically, yes. I got a little downpour at my house. It lasted literally 30 seconds and it was gone. Uh, we need something more significant. There is some hope in the forecast as we get into next week. 85 so far today. The low this morning, 75. It's going to be another warm, humid day. The records are 92 and 34. You know what? We can get close to that number. That was set back in 1979. We're going to talk more about that forecast and that chance for that cold front coming up. Kind of like those single days of cold weather. You get teased a little bit, and then it gets hot. And today we had a little bit of rain, but not much. And now we're <laughs> thinking we might get more. It's like, I'm just man. tired of these one-day cold fronts. Yeah. Could we have a string of I'm two or you. three? Well, I, I, next week is the most promising front I think I've seen in a while. We do have one on Saturday. It's probably going to be one of those one-day fronts, though, in and out. But uh, Monday, looking a little bit better. Right now it's hot, 85 degrees. We've got uh, south southeasterly winds at 16, gusting to 23, so it's a little bit breezy. And that southeasterly wind is dragging in a lot of humidity, so it's also sticky outside. We actually have a heat index to deal with. We'll have that through the afternoon. There you look at the satellite picture. Clouds continue to scatter out. We had some thick cloud cover this morning. Did bring a few showers with it. Those showers are gone. And uh, we'll see partly cloudy and mostly sunny skies this afternoon. Temperatures are already on their way up. 87 in New Braunfels, 85 in Seguin, 85 Pleasanton. We mentioned yesterday we got up to 92. I think we'll get close to 90 again today. The record is 92, by the way, this afternoon. So we could be closing in on some record heat here. The clouds have been a little bit slower to scatter out out west. So still a little bit cooler there in Rock Springs and mostly cloudy. 77 there. Dew point tracker shows we've got high dew points all the way until Saturday. They drop off with our first front. But again, it doesn't last very long because by Sunday we're back up in the 60s. Now one change. This model has brought dew points back up on Monday because it's changed the timing of our next big cold front. There's still a lot of questions there as to when this front will arrive, but I think sometime during the day on Monday we'll get a stronger front. This will bring some rain chances and some cooler temperatures. We'll talk about that in just a second. First, there's a look at the heat index. 89 is what it feels like here in town. Feels like it's in the low 90s. New Braunfels, Gonzales. And heat and disease will probably jump into the mid 90s today. It just does not at all feel like October. Radar is pretty quiet. We had some showers yesterday along the coast. We're not even seeing that today. So again, if we see anything, it'll be light and few and far between. There is some snow up to the north, quite a bit of snow across the Midwest. This is where the active weather is right now. Minneapolis, the snow is flying this afternoon. We'll get some accumulations there, but that's really the only active, really active part of the country. There are some showers and storms across parts of Florida today. Meantime, in the tropics, we got to touch on this a little bit. We have Epsilon out there. It's a tropical storm. And then you got another little area there in the Caribbean that is being monitored by the Hurricane Center, but the chances of any development here are very low. This looks very unorganized and it's moving west, so we're not going to worry too much about it. There's really zero chance of it working up towards Texas or the Gulf Coast in general. Here's what the forecast looks like going forward. Uh, in the 80s through much of this week, we got our first front on Saturday. This is 5 o'clock. They'll probably bring temperatures down into the low 80s. It'll bring two points down too, which is nice. And then we'll fast forward to Monday. This is Monday morning. Shows a front on our doorstep. Again, there's still some questions about the timing of this, when it will arrive. When it does, though, we think it'll bring gusty winds, some much cooler temperatures, and a chance for rain. That's the good news here. This model shows quite a bit of rain with the front, even some snow behind it. The Texas Panhandle, that's just how cold it will be, theoretically. We've got to watch this for a little bit longer, still a ways out. But again, there is some hope as we look down the line. 90 degrees today, partly cloudy skies southeast. Julie winds 5 to 15 and gusty tomorrow. Same story. We start off with drizzle, some morning cloud cover up around 90 for a high. First front cools us down to 82 on Saturday. Back up to near 90 on Sunday, but there is that second front right now. We're calling for 75 and a 30% chance of showers. That is all subject to change. My hope is that we'll up those rain chances as we get closer. We hope this uh, roller coaster gets started. Yes, we, we need, need it to. Yeah, thank you. Yep. So a couple more movie fans are headed to the theaters. However, that may not be enough. While well, the world's largest movie theater chain says it could run out of money by the end of the year.
The pandemic continues to hit the entertainment industry pretty hard, especially movie theaters. Now, AMC says it's facing a cash crisis. CNN's Mandy Gaither explains why the theater industry is having trouble getting back on its feet. Beginning October 23, movie theaters outside of New York City will be allowed to reopen at 25 percent capacity with up to 50 people maximum per screen. From state shutdowns to uneasy customers, the movie theater industry is feeling the pinch from the pandemic. Since shutting their doors in March, theaters have tried to reopen with health measures meant to help curb the virus's spread. Yet the industry hasn't been able to get back on its feet. AMC, the world's largest movie theater chain, has had an attendance decline of 85 percent compared to last year. AMC announced this month its existing cash resources would be largely depleted by the end of this year because of the reduced movie slate for the fourth quarter. Major films like the new James Bond have been pushed to next year and others like Disney's Mulan skip theaters altogether going straight to digital. Cineworld Group, the owner of Regal Cinema, suspended operations of all its U.S. and United Kingdom theaters this month, affecting 45,000 employees. AMC said it has two ways out of its cash crisis. Either more customers need to buy tickets or it will have to find new ways to borrow money. For Consumer Watch, I'm Mandy Gaither. In your spotlight, spotlight news, Disney releasing a new trailer for The Mandalorian. Star Wars fans are going to be able to watch the new series in just a few days on Disney+. Plus. Most of the preview focuses on The Mandalorian's continued adventures with the child. It also includes an ominous moment where he is warned about the worlds he is trying to visit. The Mandalorian returns to Disney Plus on October 30th. And John Oliver now has a sewer plant named after himself. The mayor of Danbury posting a picture with Oliver at the dedication. On August 16th, the host of Last Week Tonight did a segment on racial disparities on juries aiming at the city of Danbury. That's when the mayor suggested naming their sewer plant after Oliver. Well, Oliver took the offer and ran with it, saying he would donate $55,000 to local charities if the mayor agreed and clearly he did one honor that doesn't stink <laughs> or maybe does or maybe <laughs> yeah never never stink. oh pumpkin decorating today Ooh. and they also have an interview with a dancing with the stars judge oh, yes mm -hmm. indeed She's, I'm, I'm not the judge no 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hey today i say hi though we didn't know pumpkins could be so pretty. How to turn your pumpkins look at that, into a beautiful succulent garden. And autumn is here and we share some fall finds to spruce up your living space and how you can get into the Halloween spirit with some scary movies. Yes, and we chat, or I should say Fiona chats with judge and pro dancer Derek Huff on how he thinks this season's going. Plus, we have an exclusive on how you can get free tacos from Holy Smoke Barbecue, and we're going to reveal where and when in the show today. And we want to know, so how do you decorate your pumpkins? You carve them, stick your hand in there, and pull all the guts out of them, or do you paint them? SA Live continues in just a couple of minutes.